There have officially been 107 episodes of Anime Abandoned, and I find myself asking a very simple question. Why haven't I talked about Rintaro yet? It's not like I haven't talked about a Rintaro-directed anime before, or that he's just some name director that hardcore fans know. The man was a pioneer and worked with some of the most influential people in the industry. He co-founded Studio Madhouse. He's helmed some of the most beloved anime titles of the late 70s and early 80s. The guy is an important figure to the culture. Well, I think it's because it's hard to get a beat on him artistically. When you look at his body of work, you have a tough time believing that the same man directed all of these titles. Really? The same guy who directed X, directed Final Fantasy Legend of the Crystals, and Harmageddon, and Reign the Conqueror? The man is all over the place in terms of individual theme and aesthetic, to the point where it becomes difficult to find where Rintaro's touches can be felt. In a way, he's the best director a manga writer could ask for, because he will bend over backwards to try to stay true to the source material. Nearly every anime he has ever worked on was an adaptation of a novel or a manga, and when you compare and contrast the many OVAs, films, and TV series he directed, you realize just how chameleon-like he is. There are only a few times I could ever recall him straying from the source material, and one of them was Doomed Megalopolis, and we all know how that turned out. Still, he has been inexorably linked to quite a few seminal classics, ranging from Astro Boy to today's topic of discussion, Galaxy Express 3-9, part of an epic series of sci-fi manga penned by Leiji Matsumoto. If Rintaro had a signature movie or series, this would be it, as it comes closest to capturing what I feel is his signature style. And what is that style? French. Really, really French. Like Jerry Lewis singing Boom as Gerard Depardieu smokes a cigarette and looks down his nose at an American tourist in Paris French. Besides the look of the film, I mean, come on, the pervasive feeling of Galaxy Express 3-9 feels very much in tune with what we typify as French cinema. The non-stomp on we, the romanticizing of outsiders, and misunderstood youths. But what does this mean for the quality of the film, I hear you ask? Well, I'm gonna level with you guys. This is a two-hour film that is basically a retelling of a 113-episode television series. How good can you reasonably expect this to be? Yup, this film is pretty much a Mirror Universe Hobbit, and though that might sound cool, the ending result feels incredibly clunky. More to the point, this uniquely anime habit of paring down an established series to make a film just has me baffled. If the story has been told in its most appropriate format, why mangle the story just to tell it again in a different format? Even stranger was that the film came out before the series ended, so it basically just spoiled the ending for the television series. Why would you do that? Still, it's not like it's impossible for someone to edit down a season or two and come out with a fully realized film. I haven't seen it happen, but I also haven't seen a Higgs particle either. There's no getting around the fact that the cliff notification of the story really takes a lead pipe to the film's kneecap, but how does it do otherwise? Well, let's find out. We begin our story with an orphan street urchin named Tetsuro, who seems to keep the company of other abandoned kids, which can only mean they are a gang of pickpockets. And look, a train station full of bourgeoisie assholes are right there, just begging to be nicked. <laughs> if they can't afford a ticket, they should just move along. Hey, I didn't know Q from Third Strike was in this movie. Or that he voted for Mitt Romney. Okay, quick side note. This is a future where the rich replace their body parts with robotic counterparts, essentially allowing them to live forever. Apparently, this guy hasn't sprung for the robot saliva glands yet. In any case, Tetsuro spies Q and his lady friend purchasing a rail pass for the eponymous Galaxy Express 3-9, and swipes it from him. And before you know it, he's only one jump ahead of the slowpokes, and one skip ahead of his doom. Next time, he better use a nom de plume. Wait, that's stupid. Why would he use a nom de plume? Fuck you, Tim Rice! These rail passes must be worth thousands of dollars because they send the entire department after this kid through alleyways, over broken bridges. They will not stop until they kill this fucking kid. What you think about when the 15th round of you're coming out? Adrian! The kid tuckers himself out and collapses into the arms of a woman he bumped into back at the train station, who is suddenly here for some reason, and who decides to take him with her. Kill him if you have to. Halt. Wait! What the... 
Uh, oh, come on! There was a camouflaged elevator right there? I have an easier time believing in the wonka Vader, And that motherfucker flew! The creepy starts to get into high gear when we see that the woman has taken it upon herself to bring Tetsuro back to her home unconscious, and then whips out what looks like a Pokedex to spy on his dreams that look like they're being screened on a Game Boy. Look, Tetsuro. The Galaxy Express has just reached the end of the line at Megalopolis Station. Oh. Huh? It's snowing! Jesus shit chucking Christ! What the fuck is wrong with your eyes?! If we had mechanical bodies, we'd hardly feel the cold at all, would we? And we also wouldn't have eyes that were too close together like the headlights on a fucking Jeep! I just can't get over this. Why the hell does Tetsuro look like this? I mean, yeah, it's a style choice, but it makes him look completely ridiculous. It's even worse when his mother is killed by what's known as trophy hunters, and we have to watch as they say their last goodbyes. This should be emotionally devastating, but then it cuts back to Kid Clops here and BAM! All drama bottoms out like Marv in Home Alone 2. <laughs> this is why character design is important. It makes or breaks a scene's mood. Jinro wouldn't be nearly as gritty and intense if all the characters looked like they were drawn by Masami Obari, and Barefoot Gen wouldn't be as terrifying if the children didn't look as wide-eyed and innocent to contrast against the horrors that they faced. This is why we don't do shit like this! Do you get it, movie? <sighs> Moving on... Tetsuro wakes up as the woman introduces herself as Maytel. She admits that she was peeping in on his dream with her device, and Tetsuro reacts like she just told him she had burgers for dinner. I guess major breaches of privacy mean nothing in the future. You probably won't believe me, but I'm not a thief. I just steal things I can't afford, which is everything. Damn it, Rice! It's just you needed that pass, no matter what. That's right. Without it, I can never get a machine body. And what would you do with it if you had one? Eh, have the strength of five gorillas. <laughs> Maytel hears Tetsuro's story of wanting to get a machine body so that he might be able to kill the trophy hunter that killed his mother, Count Mecha. Ugh. So she hands him a rail pass and tells him that he can have it on the condition that she comes with him to their final destination in Andromeda. And of course, since Tetsuro is such a rock-stupid kid who'd take candy from a stranger in a white van, he immediately accepts her weird condition. And here is where the film really stumbles. Because this plot structure was supposed to be episodic in nature, either through manga chapters or through television episodes, the narrative was paced as such. In those iterations, Maytel and Tetsuro stopped off at a hundred different planets because, since it's a train, it has stops. And the episode would be about their adventure at that particular stop. And that's perfectly fine. It's a book-ended segment of a larger story that stands on its own. But that doesn't work very well within the narrative context of a film. Maytel and Tetsuro don't stop off at a hundred different planets, of course. But the story still rides the rails all the same, and this stop-and-go plotline feels needlessly jarring. Not to say that all films need one single continuous plot, as one of the best comedies of all time, M.A.S.H., also had a segmented arc with no real overall story. But right there is the difference. There was no endgame set up. No villain to defeat, as it were. It was just a series of incidents that provided for a funny film experience. It didn't matter that the football game had nothing to do with Trapper John and Hawkeye going off to do surgery on a congressman's kid, because that's how the film was presented and intended. Here, we know that Tetsuro intends to confront Count Mecha and exact revenge. So what the fuck are we doing here on Titan? Well, we know that the train has to make stops, but if they were able to pare down the number of stops from 100 to about 4, then why couldn't they have the train immediately dump them in Andromeda? Because it wouldn't fill out the running time for a movie? Well, maybe it shouldn't be a movie then. At least not with this kind of plotline. It's not like you couldn't have made a great film about Galaxy Express 3.9, but not just by lazily pruning away stopgaps into the story. The key word here is adaptation. Adapt the story. Don't abridge the story. The day will come when even your most heartbreaking memories will be precious to you. You'll wish you'd looked while you had the chance. Ah, there'll be plenty of time for that when I'm old. The only thing I got time for right now is that machine body.
So, as you can surmise, a good chunk of the movie is spent following Tetsuro and Maytel on their misadventures on the planet of the day. Their first stop is Titan, where Maytel is kidnapped and Tetsuro has to save the day. But not before an old woman dresses him like it's Halloween and he's going as Blondie from The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Maytel was right. Titan is beautiful and all, but what kind of a law lets you kill people? Looks like somebody never had to stand their ground. Tetsuro manages to find the kidnappers, who turn out to be bandits that have a bone to pick with Count Mecha, and they just let Tetsuro and Maytel go. And we never find out why they kidnapped her in the FIRST FUCKING PLACE! Well, at least they tell them that in order to find the Count, they need to find the space pirate Emeraldus. And when there's Emeraldus, you know who can't be too far behind. And conveniently, Emeraldus' ship zooms past the Galaxy Express, and Emeraldus herself boards the train when out of desperation, Tetsuro fires upon her. She winds up telling him where Count Mecha can be found, and also conveniently, it just so happens to be the very next stop on the 3-9. But wait! There's more! Not only does he find out the exact location of Count Mecha by running into the Wastelander Toshiro by complete accident, having magically procured a motorized tricycle to get him there, but Toshiro also happens to be the son of the old woman that gave Tetsuro the gun and hat. What did Tetsuro do? Inject himself with the luck virus? Now all we need is a B-47 stroke 7RF resistor. <laughs> yeah. Now let me assure you, if it seems like I'm skipping a lot in this review, it's because I am. I know I keep hammering this point, but it can't be overstated how poorly told this film is. There's some semblance of plot relevance when the story becomes sidetracked during these stops, but in service to the overall story, you're just left asking yourself, what was the point of that? Why are we focusing on the wistfulness of a mother longing for her child if we only see her for, at best, five minutes of screen time, and her child for maybe three minutes? And what does this have to do with Tetsuro's story? Well, nothing in the long run. In fact, if you strip away everything that wasn't directly related to Tetsuro killing Count Mecha, the movie would be about... Eh, an hour? Maybe? In fact, there's an edited version of this film that cut out 30 minutes, and I don't normally advocate this, but I can totally see how and why they did it. I haven't seen it, so I can't attest to its quality, but if this is the alternative, then I'd be willing to give it a try. Bottom line, if your story is about a boy's coming of age, have it be about his coming of age! Anywho's it's Tochiro is basically here to die after he imparts his information to Tetsuro, for no other reason than to die. But at the very least, his death does summon the greatest thing to ever happen to anime. Captain Harlock, the most baller, badass captain to ever helm a star cruiser. And I don't care that the film utterly wastes him. I don't care that he only shows up for about 10 minutes. I don't care that he is rendered completely pointless in his last scene, basically relegating him to Boba Fett status. I don't care that he's just slapped into the story for no other reason than to have Captain Harlock in the movie. So there's nothing I can say to stop you? No. But let me ask you, why did you save me back there? Well, after what you did for my friend out there, I could hardly let you die. And I don't care if he had no way of knowing if Tetsuro and Tochiro had anything to do with each other, because it's fucking Captain Harlock! Who said Captain Harlock? Look, Swamp! It's him! It's really him! Oh my word. Why didn't you tell me you were going to talk about my lord and savior? Because I didn't expect him to... Wait. Your lord and savior? Of course! Who better to model my life after than a charming, sophisticated rogue who could set the panties of any woman on fire? Just... Look at him. The scar and eye patch suggest a past fraught with danger. He's tough, majestic, but vulnerable. Like an eagle with a broken wing. His stoic nature belies a true romantic. He has a heart that beats in tune with the drum of battle, but also eyes that have seen too much of what battle brings. Oh, Harlock. I'll be there to comfort you. Huh. Okay. Never thought I'd hear you talk that way about another man. There's nothing wrong with having a man crush, Sage. Stop being so bromophobic.
Wait, bromophobia? I expected better from you, Sage. So what if I want Harlock to dump his sweet man chowder into my waiting and quivering he pussy? What right do you have to say that's wrong? What the? How do you have the moral high ground here? And he pussy? Damn your ignorance, Sage. God. I gotta wash this moment out of my mind. I'm gonna go crack open another bottle of bourbon, then watch four hours of bully bisexual cuckold porn. I'll be in my bunk. What the fuck just happened? So Tetsuro manages to find Count Mecha's flying fortress at the right time and sneaks on board. Apparently, Mecha's cleaning lady didn't come by because his entire home is littered with skulls. I get why he has them, but just leaving skulls littered all across the floor? Count Mecha, your evil lair needs a martinizing! Uh, mother... Oh, 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 wow, ha. Ah. Okay, it's been a while since I've seen something as fucked up as a child walking into a room and spawning the corpse of his mother stuffed dead and mounted like a moose head. Point to you, movie. I don't know you. My name is Tetsuro Hoshino and you killed my mother, you metal bastard! I kill a lot of mothers. Let me guess, you want vengeance, blah, blah, blah. That's right! <laughs> Okay, why wasn't this guy in the film sooner? You mean to tell me that you had a fun, over-the-top, villain-for-villainy-sake antagonist just waiting in the wings for an hour and 20 minutes into the film? Well, it's finally time you decided to show up, movie! I mean, yeah, he did have an appearance back in Tetsuro's Dream Slash Flashback, but we haven't checked on him for nearly an hour of movie time, which is probably why when Tetsuro finally does confront the Count and kills him, it's just a veritable thud of a climax. But then again, when your fortress comes equipped with a turn everything into rust in the case of my death button, there's way more sillier things that need our attention. So, that's it, right? Tetsuro kills the Count, his vengeance has been exacted, and his journey is over. Of course it isn't. No, now Tetsuro hates machine bodies and wants to destroy the planet where they manufacture them. For great justice! Movie, you're over. The bad guy has been slain. There is nothing left to do. Why do you still have 30 minutes left to go? If the film stumbled when the three nines started chugging along, then the final act is where it face plants into an open sewer ditch. It's revealed that Maytel was leading Tetsuro on to join the Machine Empire and be made a robot in Andromeda, for she's actually the princess of the machine world. Like, was that the plan all along? Because it could have gone wrong in too many different ways for me to even list. Worse yet is that when they arrive and they're confronted by the robot guardsmen, the dumbest line in the entire film is said. Rejoice, male! For you have been accepted for mechanization, despite your unpardonable crime against our lord, the now deceased Count Mecca. Had you not been accepted, you would have been terminated immediately. But now you shall live in glory forever as a mechanized human component of planet Maytel. So, he killed your Count, and you're rewarding him with immortality. Oh, please, have mercy on the poor kid! Yeah, he doesn't want the procedure anymore, so it would be a punishment now, but why even bother with the mechanization in the first place and just kill the kid? But the stupidity keeps marching on! Now, hold on to your butts, folks, because you may have seen stupid before, but this is balls-numbing idiocy. So, get this, there was a plan all along and that Maytel was actually recruiting humans into the machine world so that they might be placed as living mechanical components in strategic locations all across the planet that would detonate themselves via a secret pendant that is carrying the electronic soul of Maytel's father so that they might act like suicide bombers and destroy the planet. And her mother, the Queen. I don't know. I don't think it's gone full retard just yet. Your hands are so warm. How can you be a machine? My body is your mother's, Tetsuro. There we go! I just... Why do you have a copy of Tetsuro's mother's body exactly? No, fuck that. How the hell do you come across her body to make a copy of it? This is so profoundly dumb, so unbelievably moronic and forced, that I was literally speechless the first time I saw this movie.
I get what they were trying to do with his and her relationship, but to actually have her body be a copy of his dead mother without explaining how or why she would logically do that is the film pulling down its pants and laying a gigantic jack-in-the-box taco shit right on my face. This criticism is brought to you by Jack in the Box, proudly serving stoners everywhere at 4 a.m. Jack in the Box, where else are you gonna go? Arby's? Really, the last 30 minutes of the film is this idiot parade of plot points, followed by canned shots of Harlock and Emeraldus uselessly firing on the machine planet. Way to go, guys! You blew up a planet that was gonna blow up anyways. Fantastic. Luckily for us, the film draws to a close as Maytel and Tetsuro make their escape on the 3-9, and Maytel leaves him back on Earth to ride the galactic rails again. Alright, I'm pretty sure I came off as harsh during this review, and I believe it deserves all of my bile, but... I really, really wanted to like this movie. For its time, the animation was simply gorgeous, and even though the character design ranged from iconic to what the hell were they thinking, this was a beautifully made film. Most of the time. I also loved the atmosphere the film created, and I loved how it realized its world full of advanced technology and otherworldly sights. But goddamn, this story is shakier than a chihuahua in Alaska, and it's told with all the grace and aplomb of an elbow deep pap smear. Galaxy Express 3.9 is one of the few films that make me legitimately rage. Not so much because of how bad it is, but because it could have been so, so much better. Don't worry, Galaxy Express 3.9. I'm not disappointed in you. I'm just mad at you. Well, after being let down with the first review of the year, I decided to go in a different direction and talk about a movie where I had no expectations at all. And it was still crappy. Till next time. <laughs>